Good evening and welcome everyone. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. There are two buttons that I'd like you to pay attention to. One is the question and answer button to ask questions at any time during this program. And the second is a chat button that is currently disabled that is, dis that is disabled currently, but will activate later in the program. Thank you. In honor of our ancestors and Mes de la Etia Negra in Panama, thank you for joining us this evening for this very important virtual event. Pan-Caribbean Voices, Connecting People and Sharing Stories relating to the Panama Canal, being hosted by Pan-Caribbean Sankofa and the University of Florida at Gainesville. We begin this evening with a word of prayer from Reverend Oral White, son of Basil and Ada White, a native of St. Anne's Parish in Jamaica. For the past 10 years, Reverend White has been serving as pastor of the First Isthmian Baptist Church in Colon, Panama. We extend a warm welcome to Reverend White for the invocation. Let us pray. God of all creation, we are in awe of your wisdom and power. You are worthy to be praised. People from every language, nation, tribe, race, culture, and creed attest to your goodness, your mercy, and your love. For you are God who intervenes in human history for the freedom, peace, and advancement of all. The peoples of the Pan-Caribbean and Pan-American region can trace your caring hand, your guiding and providing hand in their history, in the breaking of chains of slavery, in the raising of flags of independence, in the exodus of people from under oppressive regimes to enter new lands of opportunity to live a better life. Today, O oh Lord, we praise your name for the historic undertaking of the construction of the Panama Canal, for the turning point that it was for many migrant families from the Caribbean and for their legacy that lives on to this day. We, their descendants, members of the diaspora, friends, and well-wishers all tell you thanks, not just for their intellect and creativity, for their hard work and humility, but also for their spirit of goodwill and sense of community, inspired by fear of you and faith in you. For every shovel of dirt moved, for every dollar earned, for every family provided for, we are inspired by the ambition that took them to live and settle in totally new surroundings. We are inspired by the hope and perseverance with which they live through dangerous and difficult moments. We are filled with a sense of pride when we look on this wonder of the world that is still in operation today. Now, Lord, as you have inspired us to research, record, and raise awareness of the roles played by these families. So may your spirit also inspire us to play our part to open new opportunities for human advancement. Inspire us to preserve and build on the wholesome values that they have taught us. Inspire us to pass on a legacy of goodwill and faith to future generations. So we pray now that you would bless us in this evening's proceedings and make us always channels of your blessing for Christ's sake. Amen. Thank you for the blessings, Pastor White. Hello again. My name is Francis Williams Yearwood. I am a descendant of grandparents from Barbados and Jamaica and the seventh of nine children born to Panamanian parents. 
My grandparents came to Panama during the construction of the Panama Canal. They worked, lived, and raised their children on the former canal zone in the towns of Red Tank, La Boca, Gamboa, and Pedro Miguel. Before I begin, please allow me and the members of Pan-Caribbean Sankofa to thank the University of Florida, namely John Nemers and Betsy Bemis for bringing this project to life. To Dean Judith Russell and Senior Associate Dean Patrick Reeks for your support of this project. And to Professor Leah Rosenberg for your encouragement from the very start. Less than a year and a half ago, we met. I shared my observation and concern you listened, and before I knew it, we were invited to the university for a table discussion. See, I had attended a reunion in Orlando hosted by the, Pan the Panama Canal Society, an organization of former Can American Zonians who lived and worked on the former canal zone. Truthfully, I knew no one. And as you can imagine, I was one of the few black faces in the crowd. A little bold, I would say, but I was on a mission. I was there to distribute flyers to raise awareness about the Corazal Gatun Mount Hope Cemetery Preservation Foundation, an organization that was founded in 2016 to address the disgraceful neglect of the cemeteries where our ancestors, the builders and workers of the canal, Panama Canal were laid to rest. As I walked the halls of the convention, I was drawn to a room where they were, they were conducting a silent auction. The room was filled with books, photos, and other memorabilia of the Panama Canal and the Canal Zone. In the same room, there was also a digital display and photos on the wall of the infamous 1989 Operation Just Cause. In another room, I watched a film depicting community life in the towns of the Canal Zone where whites lived. Something seemed odd. The more I peruse, I said to myself, this is a one-sided story. There was nothing there depicting the lives of West Indians who also lived and worked for the Panama Canal. Absolutely nothing about my people, a determined and resilient people who persevered despite all odds, worked hard, endured pain, poor condition, injustices, to pave the way in hopes of a better life for themselves and their families. Nothing about our communities and history. It was as if we did not exist. In my head, I kept thinking how a people who contributed and sacrificed so much, paid the ultimate price in debt, continued to be marginalized so blatantly. I approached a table in the room and introduced myself to Betsy Bemis. We chatted a bit about the display and she explained that the UF, the University of Florida, acquired this collection, a collection from the former Zonians who owned and managed it for many years, but were no longer able to sustain it. Again, in my head, I'm saying, well, no wonder. This is their story as told by them. Nevertheless, I knew that I had to say something. I then shared my observation and concern with Betsy. I said that it all seemed like a one-sided story. Betsy listened and respectfully acknowledged my observations. She explained that they had little or no information about the lives of the West Indians during the Canal era. She encouraged me to come back to meet her boss who was not there at the time. I went back the next day and met John Nemers, who is the curator of the Panama Canal collection at the George Mathers Library at the University of Florida Gainesville. 
As with Betsy, John listened, agreed that this was something his dean and others would be extremely interested in having a further conversation. In no time, I received an invite from John to meet with them at the University of Gainesville. I immediately reached out to members of CGM, the Cemetery Foundation, and folks from our community to galvanize a group who could join me at this meeting. A special thank goes out to Fred Smith, Ricardo Millet, Arcelia Hartley, Louis Emanuel, Carla Celine, and Claudia Thorne, who all took the time to join me in the initial conversations with the university. Thus the birth of CGM sister arm, Pan-Caribbean Sankofa, and the partnership with the University of Florida. Today, Sankofa has four directors, Arcelia Hartley, Kazma Coburn, Carmen Eccles, and me. Along with the support of Tony Robinson, Amber Harris, and several others who conduct interviews. The university supported these interviews and have provided funding for this event. The word Sankofa is a metaphorical symbol used by the Akan people in Ghana, generally depicted as a bird with its head turned backwards, taking an egg from its back. It expresses the importance of reaching back to knowledge gained in the past and bring it into the present to make positive progress. The goal of PCS is to document and preserve the experiences of people as told by the descendants of the West Indians who lived on the former canal zone and in Panama and who worked for the Panama Railroad and the Panama Canal. Not all West Indians who worked for the Panama Railroad and the canal lived on the canal zone. Many lived in places outside the zone such as Russia Yard, Patio Pinel, Huachapali, Colón, La Boca Tongue, Chavio, and they share a different experience that also must be told. While we may share different perspectives, as living descendants of the West Indians who came to Panama, it is up to us to share our stories so that history gets it right. Their contribution and sacrifices must not be forgotten. We need to tell the story so that our future generation can know their history and that the academic world can have a more comprehensive understanding of our experience, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Our diaspora is vast, so it pleases me to know that the University of Florida will ensure that this history collection will be permanently held in the archives of their institution and made available to all. Thank you again for being here and for attending this event. I am now pleased to introduce the curator of the Panama Canal Museum collection at the George Smathers Library at the University of Florida Gainesville, John Nemers. Thank you, Fran. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, I wanna thank you and I want to thank Pardon. Uh, first, I want to thank you, and I want to uh, thank Pan Caribbean Sankofa for an amazing partnership and for um, your incredible dedication to this terrific project. Uh, I have the privilege of serving as a curator for the Panama Canal Museum Collection at, at University of Florida. Uh, this is a leading research collection for the study of the Panama Canal, and it focuses on the uh, 20th century and the American era of the canal's history. Um, UF acquired this collection in 2012, as you, as you mentioned, Fran, from uh, the Panama Canal Museum, which was a long-running uh, long community-operated museum that was located here in Florida. Um, we have a large team here at UF that manages this collection because it is a very large collection. Um, it consists of librarians, archivists, museum professionals, um, led by our, our Dean of University Libraries, uh, Judith Russell. 
Uh, and we all collaborate to manage this massive, ever-growing uh, collection. Um, I want to share with you a couple of, uh, of our resources and images. So let me start sharing my screen here. All right. Uh, so um, we have our Panama Canal Museum collection uh, website, and uh, I've included the URL there. As curator, I can tell you that we um, we always have experienced an extremely high demand from researchers and educators for West Indian historical resources, uh, and this demand just continues to increase. It's increased uh, increased greatly in recent years. Unfortunately, our collection can't always meet this very high demand. Um, you know, as as you stated, Fran, despite the incredible contributions, the West Indian voice. Uh, often is largely underrepresented in scholarship and in research collections related to the canal and, and to Panama. Uh, and of course, we're always looking for ways to expand our, our collections so that we can support education, we can support research exhibits, digital humanities projects, and so on. Uh, through our collaboration with uh, Pan Caribbean Sankofa, we now are preserving oral history interviews in which people of West Indian descent can share their stories in their own voices. Um, and these stories document their history, their culture, the diaspora of, of the Caribbean people and their descendants. Um, it's, a, it's a great relationship because Pan Caribbean Sankofa conducts the interviews uh, and UF preserves and provides access to them in um, our UF digital collections and also in our, um, in our digital library of the Caribbean. We, uh, we make all of our oral histories available online in our digital collection. Um, we provide, some of the interviews are audio, some are video, and we are working to provide transcriptions for the interviews. They also, uh, they are both in English and Spanish, um, and sometimes, often, sometimes there's a mixture of both throughout a single interview. Um, when you go in, you can watch a video, you can, um, you can play an audio recording or you can uh, view a transcription if, if it's available. Um, we, uh, we work regularly to make these uh, interviews uh, available online. Sometimes there's a delay between the time we put the recording online and the time the transcription is available, uh, but we are working on that. Uh, many of our interview participants also donate photos and other materials to supplement their interviews, which is a wonderful thing. Um, we have, um, for example, here, um, we, we, all of the materials that we get in in conjunction with the interviews that we do, we preserve. They're now available for researchers, and many of these we're putting online uh, to supplement the uh, interviews uh, in our digital collection. Um, since our collaboration began, um, Pan Caribbean Sankofa has conducted 50 interviews, um, and that's 50 interviews through a pandemic, so that's an impressive number. Um, and, um, and we already have 40 of those that are available online. Um, we list them on our website um, as, they, um, as they come available online. Um, we really, uh, you know, I can't thank enough all of the people who have uh, participated in our interviews, have agreed to be interviewed. Um, as you can see, it's quite an impressive list. And I should note that um, we already had a handful of interviews that we had conducted in 2014 here at the University of Florida in conjunction with the centennial of the canal's opening. Um, we also have been able through this relationship to preserve some terrific interviews that were conducted by the Gamboa Reunion Group uh, that they make available on their website and now we're preserving and making available as well. Um, thanks also to those people who have generously shared their time as interviewers. Uh, several of these people have conducted multiple interviewers, uh, interviews, um, and I should note here that many of the interviews are conducted by family members, um, by former students, scholars, um, and that sometimes these uh, interviews actually become conversations because some of these interviews can include as many as um, five or 10 people. Uh, and and in, in addition to being interviewed, there's actually a discussion that occurs. So it's, it's, they're wonderful. Uh, I, I can't state it any, any plainer than that. Um, 
We also, in addition to collecting the audiovisual recordings, we collect personal narratives if people want to write something. Um, and we, um, we accept uh, written cont contributions, uh, which you can make through our website. Um, and thanks to those people who have submitted their um, information, their historical information to us that way. Um, I want to give you one quick example of um, how these resources can be used. I mentioned digital humanities projects earlier. And if you'll bear with me for a second, I'm actually going to end my slideshow for a second. And I want to go over and share my website. Um, all right. Um, we have... Um, we have a PhD student here at UF, Anrita Bandipadier, and I know I'm mispronouncing her last name, so I apologize. Uh, Anrita is working on a has been working on a digital humanities project using an app called Story Maps, and um, the project developed after discussions with Professor Leah Rosenberg, um, who regularly teaches classes on the Panama Canal and Caribbean literature and culture. Um, Anrita's online exhibit features images from our collection um, and. Uh, everything from maps to uh, cookbooks, uh, historical photographs. Um, these are all materials that are in our Panama Canal Museum collection. And um, for example, uh, pictures of Carnival and classrooms, uh, teachers, including um, um, Emily Butcher, who's one of our interview participants, as a matter of fact. Um, this exhibit, Emrita is very close to being finished with this, and when this exhibit is finished, we'll list this on our uh, website and we'll include it in the Digital Library of the uh, Caribbean in the near future. Um, and then finally, speaking of digital humanities, bear with me while I switch screens one more time. Um, we are uh, very grateful to the, uh, for the support that we received uh, from the Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere. Um, oh, wrong thing, pardon me. I, I apologize. We received uh, funding from the uh, Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere. And, um, and we want to acknowledge their gracious support. Um, I am having technical problems. I apologize. I don't know why that is happening. Uh, okay, there we go. Caught back up with myself. Uh, and so through their uh, Rothman Endowment, um, um, they, we were able to provide support to have this event. Um, so thanks very much to the Center for Humanities and Public Sphere. All right, and now I would like to uh, introduce the person who's truly been key to the success of this collaborative project. Uh, Betsy Bemis, as, as Fran mentioned earlier, is our curatorial assistant uh, with the Panama Canal Museum Collection, and she's responsible for managing our oral history program, and she keeps us all on track. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to uh, Betsy now. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. Uh, in addition to the oral history project, which John discussed, I wanted to talk about the importance of photographs in documenting the history of the West Indian communities in Panama and talk a little bit about our photography collection. Because of high demand for materials related to the West Indian communities over the past few years, we've made a concerted effort to gain a better understanding of what we actually have in the collection that relates to these communities, to increase accessibility to those materials and to acquire more of them. And about a year and a half ago, we asked a collection assistant to start compiling a list of all the photographs in the collection that possibly included someone of West Indian descent. And she spent months creating a spreadsheet for us that ultimately included over 750 photographs. We scanned about 400 of the photographs and combined those scans with images that had previously been digitized to create an online gallery. And that's what you see here on the screen. We invite you to visit this gallery anytime. 
We'll put the link to the gallery in the chat, but you can also find the link on our website and in the invitation to this webinar. Um, so I'm not sure, John, if the, there we, um, so this is the, this is the gallery and I'll move on maybe John, there we go. That's perfect. Sorry about that. So I wanted to show you two examples of individual images from the gallery and highlight a feature for you that allows you to leave comments. And the comments are a space for you to share thoughts and stories and an opportunity for you to participate in preserving and documenting this important history. So we're asking you to share your knowledge and help us improve the information that we have about these photographs by identifying people and locations and describing events. So in the example on the top, one of Pan-Caribbean Sankofa's directors, Carmen, shared memories about her personal experiences as well as identified an address, provided a nickname for the area of town where she lived and included details about everyday life in the community. In the example on the bottom, Carmen told us that one of the individuals in the photograph was her neighbor, which builds a picture of the community and Kazma, another director, provided his name. So this information will be added to our database. People will be able to search for Mr. Williams by his name and anyone who sees this photograph will now know who he is. So as you see, as you'll see when you look at the gallery, we do have a lot of photographs but most were produced by the Panama Canal Company for official reports or publications, or they were taken by US citizens. And what we lack are photos and documents that reflect the community from the community's own perspective. And we're working with Pan-Caribbean Sankofa to try and collect those things. And many of the people who've been interviewed have also shared family photos and additional materials, as John mentioned. And I wanted to share a couple examples of that with you. So Mrs. Nellie Ibarra shared a document related to her work, which is important for preserving her personal story, but also for preserving the reality and circumstances of many of the, of the original diggers and former Canal Company employees faced after retirement. Mr. Lancelot Llewellyn shared a photograph of himself and many other documents that enrich our understanding of the Boy Scouts in the West Indian communities of the Canal Zone. And Ms. Marva Gordon shared this beautiful family photograph among many others that document multiple generations of her family in Panama in the Canal Zone. We also have an example of an incredible donation from the family of Enid M. Hall that includes original materials recording the history of Laboca. Ms. Hall noted the names of the families that lived in each building, the school teachers, commissary and dispensary workers, street vendors, sports players, hairdressers, dressmakers, musicians, and many more. This is a really incredible, incredible document that this woman created. And we'll be scanning them and making them available online as soon as possible. So this is something that you'll be able to see uh, online. There are also many publications associated with the Canal Zone in the, in the Panama Canal that are already digitized and available online. And this is a page of resources from our website. So if you go to our website, you'll see the, the image on the left. Of particular relevance to the West Indian community are the Workmen newspaper, as well as the official Panama Canal publications like the Panama Canal Review, the Spillway, and a number of yearbooks. Uh, when Pan-Caribbean Sankofa was at the university visiting the collection, we also went to the Latin American and Caribbean Collection Library, which is where our physical yearbooks are kept. And Kazma actually saw her Canal Zone College yearbook for the first time, which is really wonderful. Um, we have hard copies of some of the yearbooks, but many do only exist in our collection digitally. And for most of those, we're indebted to Emilio Collins, who took on the project of locating and scanning as many of the yearbooks from the West Indian schools as he could find. And as you will see, we're still searching to fill in some of those missing years. In summary, we hope that you will enjoy the online gallery and possibly join Pan-Caribbean Sankofa and the University of Florida in our efforts to preserve this history. Lastly, we want to acknowledge that there are many other institutions who are involved in the important effort to preserve and document the West Indian experience in Panama and the Canal Zone. And this, these are only a sample of many, but these groups certainly do deserve recognition for their work. And before we start 
the panel discussion, we're gonna take a quick five minute break. And uh, so please feel free to get up and dance as you enjoy a performance by the Diggers Descendants Calypso Band. And we'll be back in five minutes to start the panel. So you have a five minute break, listen to some music and dance, stretch your legs, and we'll be back in five minutes. the diggers descendant. One, two, one, two, three, four, one. Alright, alright, alright. I went to a fiesta.
I don't know about everyone, but I've been dancing in my chair. Welcome again. Um, I'd like to take this moment to introduce the moderator. Valerie, as known as Valeria, is a third generation West Indian Panamanian, having been born in Colon to the, pr the proud descendant of Jamaican and Bayesian, Valerie immigrated to the United States in the early 1980s and grew up in Flatbush, Brooklyn. She earned a BA in political science and Spanish from SUNY Binghamton and taught Spanish for the New York City Department of Education for many years. Later, she, aimed, she earned her Juris Doctorate from New York Law School and practices in the areas of of elder law, Article 81, guardianship, wills, trusts, estates, and immigration. Currently, she's a correspondent secretary for the Caribbean American Lawyers. Valerie, who wholeheartedly believes in the mission of Pan-Caribbean Sankofa and is honored to serve as the moderator for this evening. Please welcome Valerie Howell. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This evening, we are honored to have with us three distinguished panelists, Licenciada Nelly Blackman Derivada and Mr. Cedric Gittin, who are two of the 50 infant students featured in the university's collection. And third panelist is Professor Joanne Flores Villarreal. As your moderator, I will ask Mrs. Ibarra and Mr. Gittin a few questions based on their interviews, and I will hold a few questions to Professor Flores Villarobo pertaining to her research about the women of the Panama Canal Zone. While there are countless topics related to the building of the canal, tonight's discussion is centered around the particular experiences of our panelists as descendants of West Indians in Panama and as professionals who were during and after the construction of the canal. Please note that English translation will be made available in the chat when necessary. Once we have completed the final discussion, Ms. Tony Robinson will moderate the Q&A portion of the program. Please use the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen to send questions. The chat will be open later in the program during the slideshow presentation for comments and the questions. And now I'd like to introduce our first panelist. Our first panelist, Joanne Flores Villalobos, is an assistant professor in the Department of History at the University of Southern California. Her work brings to life the West Indian women who journeyed to Panama for money, love, family, and adventure during the construction of the canal. Her book, entitled The Silver Women, Gender, Labor, and Migration at the Panama Canal, is still in progress and we look forward to reading it soon. Our second panelist, Mr. Cedric Gittin, the son and grandson of Jamaican, was born and raised in the Canal Zone. Mr. Gittin graduated from Rainbow City High School in 1951. Following graduation, he worked for the Panama Canal Company in the supply division. Then in 1956, he joined the fire department by joined the fire department. By the time of his retirement in 1987, Mr. Gittin rose to the branch of captain training officer, where he was responsible for the training of the new firefighter recruits from the Atlantic and Pacific of the Isthmus at Rodman Naval Base. And now let's take a look at a clip from Mr. Gittin's interview when he explains how he became a firefighter. The following is an excerpt from the Pan Caribbean Sankofa Oral History Project. I saw some firemen come into cold storage to do inspections. You know, these guys are, are down there, black guys, are down there, fire uniforms and that kind of stuff. And these guys came in, make, checking the extinguishers and so on, checking the hose. So I said, uh, hey, what do I have to do to get in the fire department? You got to apply to the fire department, the fire chief, or whatever the case is, and get a transfer. And I went directly across the street to the general manager's office. So he looked me over, looked me up and down, looked me up and down. He said, you want to be a fireman? I said, yes. 
So the guy picks up the phone and he's talking to somebody. He said, yeah, yeah, he looks, he looks pretty husky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He looks, you know, look like he would make a good friend, right? Okay, all right. And he hangs up the phone. So he tells me, hey, the fire chief will be here to see you in the next hour or so. I go downstairs and there's the fire chief. He looks at me and he said, are you the guy that wants to be a fireman? I said, yes. I said, what religion are you? I said, I'm Catholic. So he looks at me and he says, um, who is the priest at that church? I will tell you the truth, chief. I don't remember his name, but I know that he plays softball. He said, oh, oh, that's Jack. Okay, all right. Yeah, he, he can really hit us out. But okay, re report to the labor office on, on Monday, and we'll make the transfer. Throughout the panel discussion, I will be asking Mr. Gittins questions related to that clip and to other questions related to his longer interview. Our third panelist is Licenciada Nellie Blackman de Ibarra, who was born in Panama as Nellie Justina Paul Burt. Her mother, Vidi Catalina Burt Blackman, also born in Panama, the daughter of Jamaican parents who immigrated to Panama to work on the construction of the canal. Her father, Joseph Patrick Paul, was from Grenada, but he immigrated to Jamaica eventually to make his way to Panama to work on the canal. Mrs. Ibarra was raised by her mother and step. step Father Wilbur Blackman with her eight siblings in the barrio of San Miguel, Panama. Mrs. Ibarra received her nursing degree in 1953 from Santa Tomas Hospital School of Nursing. In 1964, she earned a degree in public health nursing specialty from the University of Panama, and in 1967, a degree in nursing sciences from the University of Panama. Mrs. Ibarra worked as a public health and occupational health nurse from 1954 to 1960 within the canal zone and surrounding areas. She joined the Panama Canal Company and Panama Canal, Canal Commission as nurse supervisor of the Home Health Care Program from 1960 to 1988 when she retired. Between 1970 and 1983, Mrs. Ibarra attended several training courses in home health care and geriatrics in the United States, from Mount Sinai Hospital in Baltimore, Montefiore Hospital, University of Florida, Gainesville, UCLA, San Francisco. And now let's turn to a clip from Mr. Bada's interview where she shares one of her memories. El siguiente es un extracto del proyecto de historia oral de Pan Caribbean Sankofa. Así es que el programa se inició realmente porque había un gobernador apellido Thatcher, gobernador Thatcher, que veía la lista de los jubilados y veía también el reporte de los que habían fallecido y, y se quedaba, pero ¿por qué estos jubilados de, de Panamá están muriéndose? El, a, a, morían siete, ocho al día en una época y él quería saber qué era lo que estaba pasando. Por lo tanto, lo que hizo eh, ese gobernador, eh, creo que llegó a, a, a Panamá a preguntar, el gobernador de la zona, un, un americano blanco, gringo, qué sé yo, interesado, yo no lo conocí. Ese gobernador fue el que prendió la, la, la chispa que hizo que todo esto se diera. Encontramos a esos pacientes en la forma más terrible, que había muchos casos que yo me, me soltaba a llorar, tenía que dejarlos y ponerme afuera a, a esperar que me pasara, porque no podía pensar que habían and now we're going to move to our question and answer section.
Hello, Professor Yellow. Hi. I'm so honored to be oh. here today with all of you. Hello. Hello, Mr. Gibson. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. My first question is for um, the three of you. You can answer. Um, we can start with Mr. Zibada and then go to Mr. Gibson and then to Professor Lotus Villalobos. My first question is why did your readers see a part of this? project to be interviewed or and also to write about it in, in Mrs. Um in Professor Flores Villalobos case. Well I would say because as part of the history of the canal this history should be known. Okay, um, and Mr. I joined the group because I believe that we should tell our stories to say who we are rather than let other people define us. So when I heard that this group was doing just that, I wanted to be a part of it so uh, I could learn their stories and share mine with them. I echo what, what Ms. Ibarra and Mr. Gittin said. Much of the history of the canal is so dominated by the perspective of Americans. Um, and really participating in this project and writing about the lives of West Indians is important because we really need to add to these histories that have been so limited by um, American sources. Okay. I'm having a little, I'm having a little um, technical difficulty on my side with the sound, but I'm going to keep going and see if it comes back on. You can hear me. I'm having some trouble hearing you. Okay. All right. So I'm going to first start with um, Mr. Kittens. I have a few questions for you. Um, my first question, you, early on in your interview, you mentioned that you were born in Cologne Hospital and you mentioned that but you were not a U.S. citizen, but you felt that you should be. Why did you make that comment? Well, because the canal zone was United States property overseas, similar to um, Puerto Rico or Guam. And any of, anyone that was born in those areas were automatically considered American citizens. So my being born in the Colon Hospital, I believe that I should have been granted citizenship. Of course, that was hidden or denied us, and we had to uh, seek redress in other ways, which later came up. Okay, and Mr. Kitten, you, after working at the gas station and then at Cold Storage, you went to work for the fire department for where you retired. You tell us of a very interesting story um, of something that appears to take place during, would take place often during lunchtime. Would you please share a little bit of that story with, with our guests? Well, um, during the uh, lunch, you know, in the fire station, we had the officer's side of the station and the firefighter's side of the station. So in the evening, when the officer's wife brought his supper. He would take his supper into his quarters and he would have his supper. And then when he's done, he would bring the plate of the leftover food over to our side of the station with the forks and the knives still on the plate. And he would offer that to the firefighters on our side. Now the guys started it was a, a benevolent offering and they would dive into the food and says, hey, come and get some of this. I said, no, I'm not interested because the guy didn't even take the forks out of the plate. His mouth water, for, so to speak, is still on the fork. And he's offering that to you. I'm not interested. So that got me into trouble with a lot of them because I said, uh, who do you think you are? You know, 
you don't want to participate. And, you know, I had problems in that respect with my coworkers. I really enjoyed reading the transcript of your interview with the difference. It's, it's clear that you had uh, somewhat of a rebel spirit, funky, and we I really enjoyed reading your the transcripts of your interview. Um, I have a question, another question for you. In 19, I believe it was in 1968, you traveled to Panama City along with your brother who served as your interpreter, the Spanish interpreter, you said that your you spoke Spanish at the time. And why did you make that trip to Panama City to be cool and to be a part of what? That? Well, actually, we received as the uh, president of the Civic Council, we received an, inf an inf invitation from General Omar Torrios, who was head of government at that time. And he was seeking to retain sovereignty of Panama, and he was speaking to whoever, whoever would listen. So he invited the civic council, the labor unions, and so on to come to a meeting with him in Panama City so he could present his case and get support. So being a Panamanian, in, not, in as much as I was living in Canal Zone, I felt that the least he could do is pay him some respect, go listen to what he has to say without making any commitments. So that's what I decided to do. However, my constituents on the Civic Council decided that they needed heaven do anything with Torrios because he was crazy. We lived in the Canal Zone. We had nothing that we needed from Panama. So we had no reason to go listen to him. But I insisted, well, you need to just go and pay the guy some respect, at least. And I decided to go because I couldn't get anyone else to go with me. So I called my brother who was living on, in Panama and I asked him to accompany me to the meeting just in case I had something to say that he could interpret for me. So I drove over to Panama alone with my brother and we went to this meeting with Torrios in which was the labor union and people from other organizations, lodges and so on. And we sat in the meeting and Torrios presented his case as to why he think that we should reclaim that 10 mile strip of land that the uh, United States thought was theirs in perpetuity. Anyway, we listened to him, he presented his case and I uh, got on the bus and came back to Rainbow City. So the wrath of my uh, court, uh, city council members, they said I should not have gone, I disobeyed the rules. And they set up a meeting to have me impeached to take me out of my position as president, which they did. They used the, what they call uh, Robert's Rules of Law and say, based on that, I had violated my rights and privilege as president, so I should vacate the chair. But I was not familiar with Robert's Rules, so as not to create a friction in the meeting, I decided, okay, I'll step aside until we can clear this up. So the vice president took over and he swore against me, what he's gonna do, I'm gonna impeach me, he's gonna find me, and what, a lot of things he was gonna do to me because I violated the laws of the city council. Anyway, I uh, took my problem to the president of the uh, labor union his name was Mr. Mujé, Saturni Mujé. He was the president of the union. I told him what happened. And he told me that those people are out of mind because the Roberts Rules does not govern the civic council. You were elected by the citizens of Rainbow City to be the president of Rainbow City. So they can't take you out of the office based on the Robert Rules. So he asked, when was the next meeting? I told him, he said, okay, next meeting I'll come. And he came to the meeting and he asked for the floor and he defended the position for me. And uh, they were forced to relinquish back the chair to me. And uh, I took over as president again. I was uh, unanimously elected for a second term. 
However, I did not complete my second term because I was promoted and assigned to the Pacific side. So I had to relocate in the middle of my second term. So that's more or less my story of the, for that question at West. Tony, Tony is going to take over for a few seconds while I try to fix my audio. I have to ask you the next question. Sure. Hello, Mr. Giddens. Um, the next question I have for you is that you shared that you believe that by 1945, the high schools went up to the 12th grade, but prior to that, they only went to the 8th or 9th grades. Would you happen to know what caused this change and how it came about? Well, the lower grades, it was more uh, physical, not mental, teachings and uh, learnings and so on. But as technology improved, they needed to give us higher education so we can continue to do their work. In other words, things like electric typewriters are coming online and other uh, new equipment for getting the work done. Typewriters, electric typewriters, that sort of thing. We, we move around from the roller decks and that kind of stuff. So in other words, to get their work done, they need to give us higher education to complete their work. So the grades kept going up until it went to 12th grade. And uh, that's why I graduated from 12th grade in a Rainbow City High School. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a break as I shift the conversation a little bit and um, address Ms. Uh, Professor Flores Villalobos. And uh, I'm, we're just curious to know when and why did you become interested in researching and writing about the experiences of West Indian women in the canal? Thanks, Tony. Um, I started working on this project when I was an undergrad. Um, I worked with my advisor, Professor Rhonda Cobham Sander, who works on Caribbean literature. I also have a lot of family in Panama. So I started looking into the history of the Panama Canal. And I realized very quickly that even though I was really interested in the history of um, Black women, Black immigrant women, it was really, really hard to find the information. And that, that became this, you know, this obsession for me to really find the place where this history lay. Um, so that's really how I got started on the project. And now it's been over 10 years that I've been working on the same topic. That's interesting. Thank you so much for that. Um, as you've been working in this area um, and thinking about the work you do specifically around the canal zone, the, the Panama Canal, uh, I'm just wondering, compared to other major research that you've conducted, <laughs> what has been some of the challenges that you see in acquiring, inquiring and compiling information for, the, for this area? Yeah, I mean, there are many challenges. And like I mentioned in my kind of initial comments briefly, the, the archives of the Panama Canal construction in particular really privilege American actors, American concerns. And so when West Indians do show up, the lives of, of the ancestors of everyone here, right, only mattered to the canal company insofar as they were productive for construction, right? So they didn't care about the social and cultural lives of people. They didn't care about, um, you know, kinship networks and families, and certainly not about women who were often not um, official employees of the canal in those early years. I always tell the story that um, one of the if you go to the archives of the Panama Canal, which are at the National Archives of the US in Washington, DC, there is, you know, there are lots of different categories. They're all about production, right? It's administration, labor, um, management, finances. There's one category about laundry. And I thought, well, this has to be where you find women, right? At least here. Uh, you go to that category and there's tons of boxes, hundreds of documents. I could tell you the cost of starching a collar or washing a shirt every single year that the US was in Panama from 1904 to 1979, 
but the archives hold nothing about the women who wash these clothes. So wow. these are some of the basic challenges of it. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's just really fascinating that you can get that information, but not details about the women. Uh, I think that's why one of the reasons we're so glad to have Miss Ibarra participating in this to kind of get a, a story from a woman's perspective. And I'm just going to ask Miss Ibarra, you know, for you, as you were a woman working with so many men, what was that like for you? <sighs> I really had no problem working with men or with women. I had, a, if you're talking about the, the canal zone time, I uh, had a lot of cooperation in my first job with Mary Chapman and Scott. And then when I was referred to the canal directly for the retired employees or the real uh, big diggers. So I really had no problem with my bosses who were men and didn't understand anything about nursing, but thank God I got all the cooperation with them to be able to take my, my job as far as I could because they were my people. And they were, they were not given the opportunity as uh, a, a US uh, citizen in, in Panama, in, in the Republic or in the United States. They were given nothing. Thank not you so much. Monthly, not even a monthly salary. <laughs> no income. Thank you so much, Tony, for jumping in. We are of West Indian ancestry, so we know how to survive. And I picked it back up, and I'm back on. Thank you so much, everyone, for your oh, help. Okay. <laughs> um, Mrs. Mrs. Ibada, on the topic that Tony just um, broached with you about working with men, you tell an interesting story about needing to borrow a pair of pants from one of the supervisors. Why did you do that? Why did you need to do that? That was while I was working with um, Mary Chapman and Scott, the construction company that were uh, hired by the Panama Canal to in a canal widening project where they used a lot of dynamites and they had huge uh, cranes and trucks and things that I, I never did see before but I had to work in that area, which is was very unsafe. And uh, nurses in those days don't use, never use pants. So if I go onto a crane, I had to put on some underwear that would cover my legs and my, so that wouldn't be seen. And when I was going down into the depth to pick up my patients and so on, I was really covered. So that's that. That's was part of it, you know. First aid, emergency first aid, and that company worked for twenty four hours a day for almost a year and six or eight months until the end of the contract, which was uh, the project of Canal Panama Canal widening project on Constructors Hill. What? So what happened after the? What happened to the diggers after they um, retired? You tell in your interview, you speak about um, going out and looking for them. Uh, the diggers now is a separate condition. While working with the, the contractors at the end of the, 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 the program or the time that they were working in the canal widening, I was supervised by uh, safety, um, uh, safety inspectors of the canal zone. I didn't know because I never had worked in the canal zone prior to, to that job with Mary Chapman and Scott. So they were watching closely what I was doing to my patients or what me and the other nurses, because we worked 24 hours a day without weekends, seven days a week until the project, when the project started and when it ended. So we were there 24 hours because that's the way constructors work, I guess. I don't know in those days. So I had to attend to my patients, emergency uh, treatment, but most likely they are diggers. They're, they're not canal diggers. We are talking about a separate issue. But that was the job that was, I've been followed, uh, supervised, and was then I was referred by them. My name was given by Colonel Brandon, who's the chief 
inspector, safety inspector to the Panama Canal Employee Services Branch who wanted to organize this program for the retired employees or for the disability relief that the, what we used to call them. These were the employees that worked for so many years. They had no retirement. They had not retirement plan in those days for them. They were contracted by from Jamaica to the canal to work. They worked five, 10, 20 years, whatever. And they were sent back to their country with their family and their, begin, their belongings. And that was it. Most of them lived in Panama. They remained in Panama. They had family in Panama. They raised children in Panama. They educated their children, most of them in the canal zone. Unfortunately, I was not in that bunch. I was never raised in the canal zone, but my ancestors were diggers. My father was digger. So that is the reason why I, I took the job to prepare and help my people, and I was going to stay just one year until the program was initiated. But that one year turned into 28 years, nine months or more, and that's the end of it. And I love every minute of it. I cry every day about what I saw, everything. I did the best because no help from the Canal Zone because there weren't residents in the Canal Zone, there weren't Americans. In Panama, they didn't work for the government of Panama. Nobody cared for them. Nobody gave them any help. So we have to start with nurses, find them. We went to the association and they gave us names and addresses and we work, we look for them and those that were in bad shape, we find help. How we find help by amistad, by friendship. Doctors who I know, doctors all the nurses knew, uh, neighbors who was a friend of so-and-so and when we got help and in the, uh, what do you call it, Central Salud Health Center that I worked for prior to the canal, uh, uh, I could go back and ask them for favors. I went to Santo Tomas emergency room and I asked my personal friends that were worked there to give me a chance to take care of so-and-so that had so-and-so and I could take, take them in and that's how it started. Thank you. So you would go through the barrios and try to find the, the retired diggers and yeah, uh, give them, provide right. them health care. That's right. We had no address. We had nothing, but we used the, the Retired Workers Association. They, they helped us. The younger ones that were there active, they, they gave us names, they gave us address, they gave us places, and or they come with us and take us where we couldn't find. And finally, in the ghetto areas, we needed help. So I had to get the policemen sometimes to go into the area. Uh, uh, for safety, I had to, we had to do so many things, but we got help from the community that mm -hmm. they lived in and from the people of goodwill that you always find uh, neighbors that were good. And it, it was a des desperate and uh, terrible situation. For instance, if we found a man that had urinary problems, prostrate, I guess, and uh, he, he wasn't seen in Panama and he couldn't go to, to, to the Gorgas Hospital for, he didn't get any kind of service anywhere because he was not a Panamanian, he was not an American. So that was it. What he did was to tie with a shoelace his penis so he could go out and get some food and come back and sit with the same situation. Other cases, I'm telling you this part that I remember. Another case was a tuberculosis. He, I, I sat down and cried. Not there because I was full of bed bugs. His house was full of bed bugs and he had tuberculosis. So the bed, bed, bed bugs was getting the, uh, at a feast. He couldn't get help from Panama. He couldn't get help from the United States government. So until we arrived and we did what we had to do, thank God. And in your interview, you mentioned that the, the insurance companies were the ones who actually ended up stepping in to help because these yes. men were the, stuck the between government, two governments. The United States government had an, uh, all their employees that wanted insurance covered with the U Mutual of Omaha. Mutual of Omaha 
accepted to give us some help. And then we created through one of the helpers, first helpers, a doctor Puertas, and we got a clinic with furnitures and everything. And then we had this first little tiny hospital. I think they had four beds for those at emergency. And that's how it started until the United States government decided many years after that they will take in and then we could use Gorgas Hospital and as usual, Panama through our contacts. I have one last question for you, Mrs. Ibarra, and then I have a question for um, Professor Flores Villalobos before we start the Q&A. Um, Mrs. Yeah. Ibarra, you talked about something your father um, went to the bank to get a loan to purchase property, as many West Indians who stayed went to the banks to get a loan. What was the process for getting a loan, a mortgage yeah. loan? My father did not go for a loan to purchase a property. Mm. He had a piece of land is where oh. I know I'm sitting. That was in 1939. So I'm talking about history. <laughs> and he wanted a loan to build a house. A house. He, had, he had the land, the piece of land, but he had to build so he could live there. And he was denied because he had high blood pressure. So my mother, she's a fighter. And she says, come. I was 12 years old then. My mother said, you speak Spanish? And I, I can hardly express, but they understand me. Nevertheless, I want you to explain what the problem. And we went to the president. Uh, Presidencia de Panamá, Presidente, uh, who the president was Enrique A. Jiménez. Uh, as a youngster, I was sort of amazed of the huge head that he had. And I was kind of scared. <laughs> they had, uh, ¿cómo se llaman los animales eso? Garza. They had garzas. I don't know how you call it in English. Garzas, Storks. they were Storks. big birds. Storks. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So I was kind of afraid. Twelve, I was really quite afraid of animals up to now. And uh, well, they, they, he, my mother told the policeman, uh, tell me to tell the policeman in Spanish that tell Presidente that the negra is here. That's why if you call me negra. I'm I'm happy. I'm negra, and my friends call me negra. See, but when is it? Is not done the right way, I would say, well, look at me twice, you know. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, we went up and this president knew he remembered La Negra and that Enrique Jimenez and he said, Negra, sube, sube. And we went up and then he said, what's wrong? What can I help you? What can I do for you? I was only 12, but I am really shocked because I've never seen nothing like that before or after. Anyways, he said, uh, my mother, my mother told him, explain what the social security. So I explained to him that social security denied el préstamo hipotecario. Mm -hmm. He wanted to build, and it, it, because he did not pass the physical exam, he had high blood pressure. And then he said, high blood pressure because of that. And, and yes, and you know, my mother would say, I have so many children, and most of them are, are, are females. I, I live in a hot area, and I don't want to stay there. I want to get out of that area with my children. And then I explained to him, and he said, Who's, who are the Social Security? I said, we don't know who. Anyways, he called right there, took up the phone. Up the phone. Dad, he called, and he asked, Hey, hey, I'm not president of the Republic, so, 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 and this, uh, and he questioned, and he said, yeah, uh, who's the person in charge? And he, he spoke to the person in charge. Why did this man did not pass this? Because high blood pressure. And what is the problem with high blood pressure? He said, <laughs> well, it's a risk. And that's what he said. He said, look, I am responsible for that loan. And that was the end of it. He promised, he helped. And it, we did. I'm right here sitting on the same house that my parents built in 1939. Thank you so much, Mrs. Ibarra. And as you say also in your interview, it's so 
um, ironic because as West Indians and with the, the food that they that they would leave to us, most West Indians had high blood pressure. So that was a way of holding back um, people from getting loans, right? Our That's people right. from getting loans. That's Thank right. you very much, Mrs. Ibada, for sharing your stories. Your I want to move to um, Professor um, Flores Villalobos with one more question. Um, I'm not sure if they had asked you this. Can you share with us something that you've learned about the women from the Panama Canal um, that you found remarkable despite their conditions? Of course, and in some ways, I feel like I don't need to say anything because Mrs. Ibarra already told us everything we need to know, right? Um, but I think it's exactly like, like you've been saying, Val, and like Mrs. Ibarra has been saying, it's about survival, right? It's about community, it's about kinship. The story that you learn if you read only the American sources is about segregation, about racism, about labor, and that's important, but there's another side to that, right? That's also about the people that were there and how they supported each other and how they helped each other survive, right? And you can hear how people, I mean, how Mrs. Ibarra is saying she went out, she wanted to help her community. They walked the streets to find people. I've read about women who were the only people who were providing food for West Indian workers who were served food in the silver cafeterias that was disgusting and wasn't, you know, ready to eat for people. And instead they were fed by West Indian women who walked around selling food from the islands, who were growing trees in their yards to be able to sell this food. So again, it's a kind of story about survival and community. And that's what's important. And that's what these oral histories help us highlight. Will, will you be using any of the, have you been visiting the oral history collection and how much of that will be going into your book? I've used a lot of the collection from the Panama Canal Museum. Um, I haven't, I mean, I'm only starting to use the oral histories now, but hopefully they will come a much bigger part of it now that we're kind of working on this project. But the Panama Canal Museum collection has already been such an important, important part of my work um, and the Digital Library of the Caribbean. Um, and you know, as um, as John and Liz were saying, there there are they have been working so hard to try to create more space for West Indian voices. They have this great collection of letters um, from West Indians who sent their memories about the canal construction period, which I use really extensively. So now I'm looking forward to adding some of these as well. And I'm I can't wait to for the next part of the program where we'll hear a little bit more about a West Indian woman who was there during the construction era. So. Perfect. I just thought of another question because it's something that I, I had known from before, but if you can share with us, when did the West Indian women, the wives, the sisters, the daughters, the mothers, did they come the same time to Panama Canal Zone when the um, white and European workers, their wives and their women came to the Panama Canal Zone? So not exactly in that I think one of the important things to always keep in mind about West Indians traveling to Panama is that it wasn't only about the US Canal, right? West Indians had long histories of migrating to Panama. Uh, you know, Jamaican women would come in the 1880s and just take boats to Panama, do laundry back in Jamaica and bring it back. Uh, so there are long ties between the islands of Panama that you know, much precede U.S. involvement. And of course, women also came, West Indian women also came as um, white American women were coming, right? But they were going through different routes and they were facing really different challenges and limitations. You know, Theodore Roosevelt and George Gothals talked about white American women as this important uh, migration, right? They really celebrated the white American women who came as pioneers. They did not do the same for West Indian women uh, and often rejected them when they arrived and criminalized them. Um, so it's a really different story comparing those two. That is a really important part of my work as well. Thank you. I want to get back to Mr. Gittins. Um, I really enjoyed reading the transcript of your, of your interview, Mr. Gittins. Um, I had a question for you regarding there was a, a story you tell about going to the commissary, right? And you had to get some uniforms or some baseball caps and then some shirts from the commissary. Can you explain about the commissary system and what that what transpired with that situation? Why did you have to go to the other commissary? Well, um, the distribution of uh, 
items for the different commissaries having to do with clothing and trinkets and so on and so on. And the commissaries were, the commissaries were dividing into gold and silver. The gold commissaries were for the white people and the silver commissaries were for the black people. Of course, the best, the best and the better stuff was sent to the gold commissaries. And um, the reason why I went to the gold commissary is, is a little story that is very uh, tender and very close to me. We had a baseball team and we wanted some sweaters or something like that. And of course, in our commissaries, it was either the wrong size or the wrong color or something like that. And uh, some of my guys said, hey, you want to um, go to the gold commissary and see if maybe they could sell you some. Of course, the gold commissary were, were for white people. But I decided, hey, let me go and see. You don't strike yourself out without taking a swing at the bat. So I decided to go to the Cristobal commissary and um, asked if they would sell me some sweaters or something, I think it was. And uh, I asked her who was the manager of the commissary. So they told me, hey, that lady down there is the manager. So I walked into the commissary, the gold commissary. And I went to the office and there was this beautiful lady, light skin, long hair, sitting there. So she looked at me and she said, what can I do for you? Who are you? I said, well, my name is Cedric Giddens and I, I'm here to see if I could buy some stuff for that we don't have in our commissaries. So she said, well, you know, you're not supposed to shop in this commissary. But I said, well, that may be true, but we don't have the better stuff in our commissary. And I came here to see if you would do me the favor to sell me what I want. So obviously she was very busy. So she said, all right, okay, come, come. And she walked me to the section I had what I wanted to buy. And she told them to sell me what I want. So then she said, what is your name? She spoke with a Spanish accent, beautiful Spanish accent. What is your name? I said, my name is Cedric Gittins. She said, okay, Mr. Gittins. Here's your stuff and be on your way. I said, thank you very much. And I left, went back to my homies and I, hey, we got the sweaters. And we did our stuff. And um, a second time we needed something, I think it was baseball caps or something like that. I said, hey, go to the commissary and see if you can do it again. So um, I went to the commissary again and I asked for the manager and hey, Manager down there. So I went to the manager and said, hey, so you again, Mr. Giddings, what do you want this time? I said, well, I want to buy some baseball caps because we don't, have, we don't either have the size or whatever in our commissary. So, oh, I, I, come, come, come quickly, quickly. And she took me, give them the caps. I got the caps and I went back. My homies were glad again, hey, you did it. Okay. One more time, we wanted something else, I forget what it was. So when I arrived at the commissary, they said, hey, go tell, her name was Mrs. Garcia. Go tell Mrs. Garcia that her friend is here. So I'm waiting to hear from Mrs. Garcia. Bam, 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 bam. So, hey, Mr. Giddings, what do you want this time? I told her. So she said to me, hey, by the way, did you win the game when you bought the baseball caps? I said, oh my gosh, Ms. would you believe me, Ms. G Ms. Garcia, we lost. She laughed and she said, well, you come to the store to get the caps and you go and lose the game? Oh my gosh. But the way she said it was so amusing. I started laughing, you know, and she, she started laughing because I was laughing. So then in, could you imagine that two people standing in the middle of the commissary laughing together. A white lady and a black guy. And we laugh and we're having a good time laughing. Anyway, she gave me the caps and she bid me farewell. And uh, that was a beautiful lady. I will never forget her. 
And um, I took my cats back to my guys and, you know, we had a good time. But those were one of the, one of the most memorable experiences that I had in the gold and silver situation in the canal zone. Thank you so much, Mr. Gibbons, for sharing that story. Now we're going to turn to the Q&A section um, and Tony Robbins, Tony is going to um, lead us in that Q&A. Thank you, Valeria. Um, uh, we have questions coming in from the audience. So I'm just going to pose them to the panelists as they've come in. One is for you, Mr. Giddens. Um, the first question for you is, can you please confirm, tell us where your, your, your lineage, are you Barbadian, Jamaican? The, the people would like to know. Well, my lineage, my lineage is from uh, Jamaica. Uh, my grandfather and my mother's side, my father's side, he was from Jamaica, a part of Jamaica they call Black River. That's on the way if you're going up to Negril in Jamaica, you have to get up to past Black River before you get to Negril. And he was a tall guy, tall, buxom guy. He was uh, ex-military, he was in the British Army, and he was decorated for some act of valor that he did. And he was decorated by the queen. He had a medal that he used to use on his, uh, my father had a medal that he used to use on his uniform. It had like a sunburst on the front. And then in the back, it had like a crown and it said from the queen, because he was decorated for some act of valor that he did. That was my grandfather on my father's side. He came to Panama and he was hired as a blacksmith, shoe the horses for the police and the soldiers and so on. He was a blacksmith. He worked until he retired. He went to Limon, Costa Rica, where he passed away in Limon, Costa Rica. But in the archives of the uh, microfilms in the Canazo Library, I was able to see a film of him that he was recognized when the Prince of Wales came to Panama some years ago. And they had a ceremony honoring all the soldiers that used to work for the fight for the British Army. And he was, he was uh, recognized in Panama by the Prince of Wales. I don't remember how many years ago that was. Like I say, he went back to Limon Costa Rica, he passed away in Limon Costa Rica. Then on my mother's side, my grandfather, he was a cosmetic salesman, sell cosmetic for makeup and that kind of stuff. And uh, before that, he was hired as a police officer in the Canal Zone because he was very big and they hired the big guys to keep order. So he worked as a police officer then when he retired, he was a co cosmetic salesman and he died in uh, Panama. He was sick, he went, uh, I think he had a stroke or something like that. And they used to feed him pigeon soup because pigeon soup had some kind of a magic cure or something like that. So I used to go get the pigeon soup for my grandfather, give him the pigeon soup. And uh, he walked with a cane as I remember. And some years ago, after that, he passed away. I had a funeral for him in the lodge hall. And I remember at that time, when you were a certain age, if you had a parent that died, he was laid out in the coffin. And then they would lift you and pass you over the coffin to the other side or something, something like that, you know. That was a scary thing, but you look down and see your parent lying there and they passing you over the coffin. That was scary. But anyway, he's buried in Mount Hope. And uh, to this very day, I can tell you what his grave number was. And I can tell you the location in the cemetery where he was buried. Now his, the headstone, the number on his headstone was 18565. That was the number on his headstone. And a lot of times when my mother wanted to go visit the grave on Memorial Day or something, I would take them because I know where to find, where to find the grave and that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, he lay, he's laying near Montop up until now. I don't know how Montop looks now because the last time I visited Mount Hope, as I recall, I think Arcelio and I and, and um, Walter visited the cemetery and it was kind of tore up, you know, it wasn't very well maintained as it was back in those days. 
But uh, my grandfather lays there. My grandmother is also buried in Mount Hope Cemetery. And uh, who else? My aunt, I have an aunt that was also buried in Mount Hope Cemetery. And uh, aside from having family buried in Mount Hope Cemetery, that was the place where you went and get the best mangoes. <laughs> so, well, I that's have, a good reason to go. <laughs> I have a lot of memories of Mount Hope Cemetery. Thank you so much, Mr. Gittens. Okay. Our next question is for Miss Ibarra. And the question for you, Miss Ibarra, is, uh, the person says, we notice you speak both English and Spanish. Did you attend school uh, learning English or Spanish? And what was your home language as well? Spanish. Uh, uh, my, my home language was this, this, uh, what we call Wadi Wadi, which is Spanglish, or <laughs> most English, but not pronunciated the right way. But then, I went to Spanish school all my way, all the way until the university. Wonderful, thank you. And another question for you, Ms. Ibarra, is um, while the canal workers were working, did they have <clears throat> medical care during their employment and then it ended after retirement? Do you did, know did what- have, I did hear what you said. Did they have what? Did the canal workers have medical care while they were working? I guess while they were working, because uh, those that were hired in Jamaica signed a contract that they will be sent to the place of work from Jamaica to Panama with all the family and belongings. And when their time was up in, in the canal, they were sent back to their origin Everything free, of course, with all the family and beginning belongings. But most of them had their homes already in Panama. They married Panama Panamanians. They live in the Canal Zone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they didn't go. Okay. But that was in the basic contract where, where when they were employed for the as a digger, the first employees of the canal. Wonderful, thank you. The You're next welcome. question is for Professor Vo Flores Villalobos. And the, the person would like to know, what courses do you teach? And does your research require you to go to Panama and conduct interviews as well? Thank you for that question. So I teach classes on the Panama Canal and on Afro-Latin America um, and on US empire and labor. And yes, my research does require me to go to Panama a lot. I don't do a lot of interviews because I mostly work on the very, very, very early construction period. So most people are not alive, um, but I do a lot of work in the archives in Panama. And so for example, in the national archives in Panama, you can go read um, old court cases where West Indian women would go to the corregidor and say, I wanna sue this person who lives next to me not Sue, but I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing, right? But you can read the court cases of how neighbors um, in West Indian, West Indian eras of Panama City are relating to each other. So there's lots of information to find in Panama that hasn't really been used for historical study. That's wonderful, rich information, thank you. And Mr. Gittens, um, someone would like to know which fire department and in what community did you work? For which fire department? Uh, Canal Zone Fire Department, Rainbow City, and Balboa. In Rainbow City, thank you. And Miss Ibarra, there's a question for you where someone would like to know what your, um, what your training was like as a nurse. Like what did you study and what kind of support did you receive? Uh, basically, uh, nursing school was a, como se dice, scholarship because my parents could not afford to send me any other place to, for nursing. And that was the only nursing school in Panama. So it really belongs to the government as a scholarship. And what they will do is to pay us every 15 days, $3 for transportation because we had to take classes at some of the university and other places where we were sent for training. 
That's the basic nursing school. In that nursing school, you had to have four years of high school education. Then you go there for three years for the nursing training, basic training, because nursing in Panama was not at the level of university. After that, then you know, the, the nursing school of Panama were sent to the University of Panama and then they had nursing school in the University of Panama. And I went to that so I could have a titulo universitario. At first I took public health for one year and then I went for the regular training as a registered nurse in Panama. Great, thank you. Um, and perhaps this one could be answered by Professor Flores Villalobos. Um, someone is interested in knowing whether the can, immigrant canal workers and families were able to maintain relationships and contacts with the, with the relatives who remained on the island. So what was that like? Um, and whether they returned or stayed in Panama for the most part, the communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually a really hard question to answer in that, of course, people maintained communication, but finding the historical evidence of that is really difficult because those are mostly, you know, family letters that aren't in kind of official historical archives. But I've found lots of evidence of people communicating. In particular, you see it um, when somebody passes away and then their family in the islands just does everything they can to be able to get in touch with the authorities find their family member, get back um, their belongings, and they'll send letters and say, look, I've been talking to my son, I've been talking to my husband, I want to know what happened to them, right? So communication was difficult, letters got lost, uh, workers moved around a lot, so it was hard to identify them and get letters to them. Um, and of course, it's hard to find that historical evidence, but people were definitely in communication. And um, in terms of whether people uh, left or stayed, a lot of people went back to the islands. Um, that's the famous, you know, Colon man who goes back to the islands and comes back with the gold ring, uh, gold watch, et cetera. But a lot of people also left, like Mr. Gittin said, um, to other places like Limon, Costa Rica, or they went to Flatbush. Um, and some of them definitely stayed in Panama, like Ms. Ibarra's family. Thank you. Great, a great answer. Um, Mr. Gittens, someone is asking about the classification of firefighters versus firemen. Is there any difference um, in how they were called, what they were called? Well, the title is interchangeable. They both uh, fight fires, whether they're called firemen or firefighters, it's interchangeable. Okay, they, they just wanted to, to see. I, I wanna remind everyone in the audience that you can submit a question via the Q&A button. We have a, just a couple of minutes left, um, but I do wanna make sure that your burning questions get answered. So if you have one, um, please definitely let us know. Um, Professor Flores Villalobos, uh, they, someone would like to audit your seminar on the Panama Canal. Maybe we can have, um, th that's a question that's floating out there. Well, I'm not teaching it in the next year, but I'll let people know when it's happening again. I would love that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, and let's see if we have one more question. So this, I'll throw this out as a trivia question. I'm sure you all know the answer, but the question that they're asking is, when did they start building the canal? And before they started building the canal, who was living in Panama? Anyone can take that if you want. Before, would I, should I answer that? Yes, please. Before the Panama Canal, I mean, there were, there were natives and of course there were Spanish colonials that, that came to Panama. So you had quite a bit of that influence here, but the, uh, the West Indian migration began with the, the railroad, the building of the railroad in the 1850s. And uh, there, so there were three waves of West Indians that came, to, came in, the first ones to build the railroad. And then the next set that came when the French began the construction of the canal uh, in the 1880s. And then uh, the, when the French failed and the Americans came in 1904. 
and uh, they're the ones that completed it. So you had three waves of great migrations, but you also can find that there were West Indians in areas like Bocas del Toro and Chiriqui that came for the banana plantations and eventually for the sugar. So uh, there were quite a few of those, but Panama's population, in fact, it's estimated that Panama's population in the uh, early 1900s, when you probably had an influx of about 100,000 West Indians that may have arrived in the country, Panama's uh, population probably have been less than 300,000. Great, thank you for that information, Arcelio. And this is gonna be our final question and it goes to Ms. Ibarra and Mr. Gittens. Um, you know, people are curious to know, when you were working as a fireman, Mr. Gittens, and as a nurse, Ms. Ibarra, what were your salaries like and did you get promotions? And we'll start with Ms. Ibarra. How much did nurses earn at the time? Uh -huh. Uh, in, in Panama, if you're talking a bit before the canal, before I went to the canal, it was um, $90 a month before. When I started working with uh, Mary Chapman and Scott, I got uh, $225 a month because of the distance and the hours plus over time. And in the canal zone, I started as a grade four. I mean, when I, the, the retirement program, nursing program, uh, when I started, I started as a grade four and 30, 60 days after I was a grade six. And then I ended in uh, grade 11 or 12, 11, 11 when I retired. Great, thank you. And Mr. Gittens, what was your salary like and your career advancement in your job? Well, um, if you're talking about strictly the fire department, as I recall, I was making something like $2 and something cents an hour. Then it went up to six, $7 an hour. And I think when I retired, I was making $21 an hour, something in that, something in that area. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all for answering the questions. And to people who submitted questions, if you did not have an opportunity to get your questions answered, we will try to answer them um, offline for you. And I'm gonna turn things back to Valeria. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, so this is the conclusion of the panel discussion, but we, the program will continue. Just wanted to say thank you to our panelists for sharing your stories and for your dedication and service to the people who lived, worked, and died at, in the Panama Canal Zone. Thank you to Professor um, Flores Villalobos for giving a voice to the stories of the women of the Canal Zone. Thank you to our interviewers who spent countless hours with interviewees, to Tony for moderating, and to our nearly 200 participants for your engagement this evening. We hope that these stories will encourage you not only to visit the university's collection, but also to start making records of your own family histories. With that said, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing one of the backbones of Pan-Caribbean Sankofa, Ms. Carmen Eccles, who will present the next segment of our program. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you to our panelists. Great question, great answers. I just want to welcome all of you, our global villagers. Thanks for joining us this evening. And I want to let you know that the chat feature is now enabled and we encourage you to share your thoughts with us. Looking back to move forward, my forefathers are from proudly Jamaica, Grenada, Barbados, and Cuba. I hail from Paraiso, also known as Ghost Town, and that's Santa Clara Zone in Panama. Looking back to move forward, my grandmother, Rose Nichols Grimes from Grenada, chatted with her, grand, her first born grandchild, Valina. And Valina focused on preserving our grandmother's proud legacy to share with her future generations and now the village. The following presentation is Vision by Rose's third fourth and fifth generation, and they encompass the period from 1886 to the late 1930s. Stay safe and pleasant good evening.
Before she passed away, my great-grandmother chronicled her long life experiences and her journey to Panama. This is her story. My name is Rose Nichols. I am the eldest of six children, three boys and three girls. I have called the village of Marathi in Grenada my home for 19 years. I was born in 1886, just, just after, after the British, British had made Grenada, Grenada the, headquarters the, the headquarters of the Windworth Island, Island government. My father had already gone down to live in Panama because there was so much work on the canal. And I don't have to tell you how excited I was. I was on a boat heading to Panama. The full weight of what I was doing didn't hit me until I saw my home island fade into the horizon. My mother's last words to me were prophetic. She says, I never will see you again. And she didn't. The excitement of seeing my father again helped me on the three-week journey. When the boat finally arrived, I stood on the deck and scoured the dock with my eyes looking for my father. I couldn't find him. Forever passed. All the passengers had disembarked. Uncle Jock took my bags and told me to follow him. I kept asking him about my father, but all he would say is, we will talk later. Freshened up, Uncle Jock sat me down and told me my father had been killed working on the canal. My mind raced. What am I going to do? My father is dead, and I don't know Jacques. I cried buckets of tears uncontrollably. I cried myself to sleep. What am I going to do? decided there and then I was a big girl. I can take care of myself. My father says an opportunity awaits me here and I was going to find out if it was true. The Americans helped the Panamanians get independence from Colombia in 1903. With all that came an upgrading of the sanitation of our country. Unfortunately for me, that made midwifery illegal without formal nursing training. What was I to do? The year was 1905. I continued to live with my uncle for the next eight years. And while I was living with my uncle, I met the most gorgeous young man you ever wanted to see in your life. Very tall, very handsome, very, very well educated and well spoken for himself. His name was Samuel Grimes and he was from Barbados. He came down also to Panama to work on the canal just like everyone else. We really, really held each other up during those times. When the crash came in 1929, I lost every cent I had in the bank. I made my children's clothes, we had plenty of food, but how I hated to be penniless again. However, life was good. In 1936, the banks returned some of the money that was lost in 29. It was cents on the dollar. 
1939, my first grandchild was born. She was named after me, Cynthia Valina. That year, we started our new home. The house took about 18 months to build. In 1939, we moved into our home. What a party we had. In 1945, Valina came to live with me. She was a handful. Priest. Valina lived with me for seven years. I taught her all I could in that time frame. She was a good student and absorbed everything like a sponge. On Christmas Day of 1956, the whole family was together. Six of the kids with their spouses, 23 grandchildren, daddy, and myself. That day, Valina announced that she was leaving Panama to go to college in the United States. The din was deafening. In August of 1957, my beloved granddaughter left Panama. My last words to her were, I'll never see you again. And I didn't. Good evening. I'm Kasma Coburn Hanlon, descendant of Jamaicans. I was born and raised in Rainbow City, Canal Zone. And I'm one of the directors of Pan Caribbean Sankofa. On behalf of the Pan Caribbean Sankofa group, I want to thank our panel, Valeria Howell, Tony Robinson, Arcelia Hartley, Carmen Eccles and the Grimes family and all participants. This project is a tribute to our ancestors who have provided us with a rich heritage. Their courage, perseverance, and determination contributed to what is now a wonder of the world, which changed the history of the world in so many ways. We are what they made us to be, a proud, courageous, and industrious people with a pioneering spirit. Most of all, we thank you, our audience, for joining us in this initial effort to uncover and highlight the history of the Pan-Caribbean people. We need you. Your participation in this oral history project is essential. Please consider the various ways in which you can participate as an interviewee sharing your story, as a contributor providing photos, documents, artifacts, and information or as an interviewer in the oral history portion of the project. We'll now show a video. It's a partial listing of our ancestors who contributed to the construction of the railroad and the Panama Canal. This list is just a sampling and does not include the names of all who were involved. It's meant to demonstrate some of our resources. Please observe a time of silence as we view the list and reflect on all our ancestors.
we're almost there. Reverend Nelson S. Edwards Bodkin attended Rainbow City Elementary School. He graduated from Colegio Abel Bravo in the city of Colón. He has now served for the past 22 years at St. Albans Episcopal Church in Paraiso and 16 years at the St. Simon's Episcopal Church in Gamboa. At present, he is a diocesan historian and a member of the diocesan board of directors. Reverend Nelson Edwards will now offer a closing prayer. Closing prayer, builders. Psalm number 127, first two verses says, if the Lord does not build the house, the work of the builders is useless. If the Lord does not protect the city, it does no good for the centuries to stand guard. It is useless to work so hard for a living, getting up early and going to bed late, for the Lord provides for those he loves while they are asleep. Loving God, creator of the universe, builder of all that has been made, we come to you in gratitude today, giving thanks for our fellowship and friendship and the promise of a new relation full of hopes and plans. We ask for your blessing upon our colleagues as our own families and ask that you bless them and guide them as they begin their journey with us. Bless and guide those of us who join them today as we seek to share our well-worn and well-intentional path with them and as we delight in learning what new things they are to learn. We ask that your blessing would rest on this team, that you would give us great vision and enthusiasm for our work. Lead us in all the work we do, so that our descendants and all who will learn from this event may reap the benefits of our collective wisdom and experience. And let us all marvel in the joy of being together from this beautiful day forward. Blessing, may the Lord bless you and take care of you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, rest remain and be with us this day and always. Amen. Thank you. All right, thank you, Reverend Nelson. And thank you to everyone who participated tonight. Uh, it was a long program. We appreciate you uh, sticking with us through the end. Uh, and we're pretty much ending right on time, which is fantastic. Um, the official program has ended. Um, we'll be sending out links to various things, to the recording, to uh, some of the resources we highlighted, uh, to the oral histories. We'll, we'll be doing that after the fact in the next uh, days and weeks, you'll be getting links from us. Um, right now at the end of the program, we're going to start a PowerPoint uh, video running with some uh, photos from our collection. You're welcome to stay for the next 10 or 15 minutes as we let this play through. Uh, but if not, uh, if you don't stay, we understand it's been a long night, uh, afternoon. Have a good uh, evening and thank you very much. Chanta, we 
Emancipate yourself from mental slavery And borrow steps can free your mind Have no fear from atomic energy Cause one of them can stop at the time All long that they kill our prophets While we stand aside and look Some say it's just a part of it But we've got to fulfill that book Redemption time Redemption time
African Link Panama. Music from the descendants of the builders of the Panama Railroad and the Canal. Coming at you live and direct. One love. Canal coming at you live and direct. One love.
Thanks to everyone who stayed. Have a pleasant evening.